Good evening. On behalf of the faculty and staff at the Friedrich von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds in Dusseldorf, welcome, and thank you for listening to tonight's broadcast. My name is Lector Finn J.D. John, Master Librarian at the von Junst Library's Corvallis Branch. It is good to have you with us tonight. Tonight we will be reading Chapter 7 of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. But first, I must finish telling you of the founding of our library of darksome knowledge and forgotten lore, a silver lining, if you will, to the cloudy demise of our beloved, lamented founder, Friedrich Wilhelm von Junst. I have told of Professor von Junst's foolish and prideful decision to sequester himself in the Great Stone Tower. As a result of this exhibition of towering hubris, he was left alone in his battle with the demonic guardian of the Hor Nigral, that terrible and malevolent tome filled with the black wisdom of an ancient race, a race of what we might call demons, creatures with translucent wings and multifaceted eyes like monstrous insects. The Horo Nigral's authors lived 200,000 years ago in the lost city of Yan Ho, deep in the forbidding mountains of what is today northwestern China, near its border with Kazakhstan. I have told of the twelve members of the Council of Prefects finding Professor von Junst there on the floor with the guardian's talon marks upon his throat, the evil Horo Nigral lying face down upon his desk, where he had been laboring to translate the cryptic runes with which it was written. I have told of the spell of destruction that lay upon the Hor Nigral, which gave the prefects but two hours before the first rays of the sun should crumble it into a sickly dust. In those two hours the twelve friends of Professor von Junst gathered together and collected their metaphysic forces and wrapped them over every surface of the library in the great stone tower ringing it to a distance of perhaps two meters, and working together, they slipped the library from the grasp of space and time. They took the building and the great stone tower outside of time, and then they brought it back and replaced it where it had stood on the banks of the Rhine in Dusseldorf, for their work was done. For what is time but a condition of existence? Having once been made manifest beyond the reach of time, an object either is or is not, eternally, no. And so once the library was beyond time, it could never not be beyond time, unless it be deliberately deleted by some overwhelmingly powerful extratemporal being, which of course is an unlikely thing, although if it were to happen, because the library exists beyond time, that would mean that the library would have to be made to have never existed, either in or out of time. But listen to me, wasting our time with my silly metaphysical prattling. Back to our story. And so the Twelve took the library out of the stream of time, and a split second later put it back into the stream of time, but preserving that split second outside of time forever. It was, if you will pardon a metaphor from a far more modern age, like a time division multiplexer that samples the sounds of a voice on a telephone line 8,000 times per second. Each of those 8,000 samplings carries that voice out of the stream of time and places it and preserves it in a sort of hyperspace for eternity, while the voice itself fades into the ether and is gone. So it was with the library when the Council of Prefects sampled it from the voice of time. Came the dawn, and with it the rays of the sun, which touched the Hor Nigral and withered it into a smoldering and toxic little ring of ashes around a single charred and taloned finger bone on Professor von Junst's desk. Exhausted from their Herculean metatemporal efforts, the twelve precepts lay as dead men and dead women on the floor of the great stone tower. Soon thereafter came the Dusseldorf authorities, who found the professor's body and wondered at the strange talon-like marks upon his cold, dead throat and at the strange finger bone. And soon after that came von Junst's friend Alexis Landau, who tried to piece his manuscript together and 
reading its contents, burned it thoroughly and then slew himself. One of the great tragedies of this story, had not the twelve of the Council of Precepts been exhausted from their efforts, perhaps they might have saved this legendary intellect and gifted explorer from the fruits of his metaphysical despair. But the lesson was learned, and well. To this day the Holy Graal may not be read without the full concentrated protection of the entire Council of Prefects standing watchful over the reader. And even then, protection is not absolute, as Lector Dougal McCormick learned one terrible night in 1943. Let us think no more upon that. But perhaps you are saying to yourself, if the library is beyond the reach of time, how is it that I can find it on a clear moonless night from the riverbank? And how is it that I receive its radio transmissions each night? It is to these questions that we will turn our attention in Monday evening's broadcast. For now, it is time to refill our glasses with aged Amontillado and continue our reading of Edgar Rice Burroughs' time-worn documentation of his uncle's extraordinary experiences on the surface of the planet Mars. Let us begin. Child Raising on Mars after breakfast, which was an exact replica of the meal of the preceding day and an index of practically every meal which followed while I was with the Green Men of Mars, Sola escorted me to the plaza, where I found the entire community engaged in watching or helping at the harnessing of huge Mastodonian animals to the great three-wheeled chariots. There were about 250 of these vehicles, each drawn by a single animal, any one of which, from their appearance, might easily have drawn the entire wagon train when fully loaded. The chariots themselves were large, commodious, and gorgeously decorated. In each was seated a female Martian loaded with ornaments of metal, with jewels and silks and furs, and upon the back of each of the beasts which drew the chariots was perched a young Martian driver. Like the animals upon which the warriors were mounted, the heavier draft animals wore neither bit nor bridle, but were guided entirely by telepathic means. This power is wonderfully developed in all Martians, and accounts largely for the simplicity of their language and the relatively few spoken words exchanged even in long conversations. It is the universal language of Mars, through the medium of which the higher and lower animals of this world of paradoxes are able to communicate to a greater or lesser extent, depending upon the intellectual sphere of the species and the development of the individual. As the cavalcade took up the line of march in single file, Sola dragged me into an empty chariot and we proceeded with the procession toward the point by which I had entered the city the day before. At the head of the caravan rode some two hundred warriors, five abreast, and a like number brought up the rear, while twenty-five or thirty outriders flanked us on either side. Everyone but myself, men, women, and children, were heavily armed, and at the tail of each chariot trotted a Martian hound, my own beast following closely behind ours. In fact, the faithful creature never left me voluntarily during the entire ten years I spent on Mars. Our way led out across the little valley before the city, through the hills, and down into the dead sea bottom, which I had traversed on my journey from the incubator to the plaza. The incubator, as it proved, was the terminal point of our journey this day, and as the entire cavalcade broke into a mad gallop as soon as we reached the level expanse of sea bottom, we were soon within sight of our goal. On reaching it, the chariots were parked with military precision on the four sides of the enclosure, and half a score of warriors, headed by the enormous chieftain, and including Tars Tarkas and several lesser chiefs, dismounted and advanced toward it. I could see Tars Tarkas explaining something to the principal chieftain, whose name, by the way, was, as nearly as I can translate it into English, Lorquas Ptomo, Jed, Jed being his title. I was soon apprised of the subject of their conversation, as, calling to Sola, Tars Tarkas signed for her to send him to me. I had by this time mastered the intricacies of walking under Martian conditions, and quickly responding to his command, I advanced to the side of the incubator where the warriors stood. As I reached their side, a glance showed me that all but a very few eggs had hatched, the incubator being fairly alive with the hideous little devils. They ranged in height from three to four feet, and were moving restlessly about the enclosure as though searching for food. As I came to a halt before him, Tars Tarkas pointed over to the incubator and said, Sock! 
I saw that he wanted me to repeat my performance of yesterday for the edification of Lorquest Potomal, and as I must confess that my prowess gave me no little satisfaction, I responded quickly, leaping entirely over the parked chariots on the far side of the incubator. As I returned, Lorquest Potomo grunted something at me, and turning to his warriors gave a few words of command relative to the incubator. They paid no further attention to me, and I was thus permitted to remain close and watch their operations, which consisted in breaking an opening in the wall of the incubator large enough to permit the exit of the young Martians. On either side of this opening, the women and the younger Martians, both male and female, formed two solid walls leading out through the chariots and quite a way into the plain beyond. Between these walls the little Martians scampered, wild as deer, being permitted to run the full length of the aisle where they were captured one at a time by the women and older children. The last in the line capturing the first little one to reach the end of the gauntlet, her opposite in the line capturing the second, and so on until all the little fellows had left the enclosure and been appropriated by some youth or female. As the women caught the young, they fell out of line and returned to their respective chariots, while those who fell into the hands of the young men were later turned over to some of the women. I saw that the ceremony, if it could be dignified by such a name, was over, and seeking out Sola, I found her in our chariot with a hideous little creature held tightly in her arms. The work of rearing young green Martians consists solely in teaching them to talk and to use weapons of warfare with which they are loaded down from the very first year of their lives. Coming from eggs in which they have lain for five years, the period of incubation, they step forth into the world perfectly developed except in size. Entirely unknown to their own mothers, who in turn would have difficulty in pointing out the fathers with any degree of accuracy, they are the common children of the community, and their education devolves upon the females who chance to capture them as they leave the incubator. Their foster mothers may not even have had an egg in the incubator, as was the case with Sola, who had not commenced to lay until less than a year before she became the mother of another woman's offspring. But this counts for little among the green Martians, as parental and filial love is as unknown to them as it is common among us. I believe this horrible system, which has been carried on for ages, is the direct cause of the loss of all the finer feelings and higher humanitarian instincts among these poor creatures. From birth they know no father or mother love. They know not the meaning of the word home. They are taught that they are only suffered to live until they can demonstrate by their physique and ferocity that they are fit to live. Should they prove deformed or defective in any way, they are promptly shot, nor do they see a tear shed for any single one of the many cruel hardships they pass through from earliest infancy. I do not mean that the adult Martians are unnecessarily or intentionally cruel to the young, but theirs is a hard and pitiless struggle for existence upon a dying planet, the natural resources of which have dwindled to a point where the support of each additional life form means an added tax upon the community into which it is thrown. By careful selection, they rear only the hardiest specimens of each species, and with almost supernatural foresight they regulate the birth rate to merely offset the loss by death. Each adult Martian female brings forth about 13 eggs each year. Those which meet the size, weight, and specific gravity tests are hidden in the recesses of some subterranean vault where the temperature is too low for incubation. Every year these eggs are carefully examined by a council of twenty chieftains, and all but about one hundred of the most perfect eggs are destroyed out of each yearly supply. At the end of five years about five hundred almost perfect eggs have been chosen from the thousands brought forth. These are then placed in the almost airtight incubators to be hatched by the sun's rays after a period of another five years. The hatching which we had witnessed today was a fairly representative event of its kind all but about 1% of the eggs hatching in two days. If the remaining eggs ever hatched, we knew nothing of the fate of the little Martians. They were not wanted, as their offspring might inherit and transmit the tendency to prolonged incubation and thus upset the system which is maintained for ages and which has permitted the adult Martians to figure the proper time to return to the incubators, almost to the hour. The incubators are built in remote fastnesses, where there is little or no likelihood of their being discovered by other tribes. The result of such a catastrophe would mean no children in the community for another five years. I was later to witness the results of the discovery of an alien incubator. The community of which the green Martians with whom my lot was cast formed a part was composed of some 30,000 souls. 
They roamed an enormous tract of arid and semi-arid land between 40 and 80 degrees south latitude and bounded on the east and west by two large, fertile tracts. Their headquarters lay in the southwest corner of this district near the crossing of two of the so-called Martian canals. As the incubator had been placed far north of their own territory in a supposedly uninhabited and unfrequented area, we had before us a tremendous journey, concerning which I, of course, knew nothing. After our return to the dead city, I passed several days in comparative idleness. On the day following our return, all the warriors had ridden forth early in the morning and had not returned until just before darkness fell. As I later learned, they had been to the subterranean vaults in which the eggs were kept and had transported them to the incubator, which they had then walled up for another five years and which, in all probability, would not be visited again during that period. The vaults which hid the eggs until they were ready for the incubator were located many miles south of the incubator and would be visited yearly by the council of twenty chieftains. Why they did not arrange to build their vaults and incubators nearer home has always been a mystery to me and like many other Martian mysteries unsolved and unsolvable by earthly reasoning and customs. Sola's duties were now doubled as she was compelled to care for the young Martian as well as for me, but neither one of us required much attention, and as we were both about equally advanced in Martian education, Sola took it upon herself to train us together. Her prize consisted in a male about four feet tall, very strong, and physically perfect. Also he learned quickly, and we had considerable amusement, at least I did, over the keen rivalry we displayed. The Martian language, as I have said, is extremely simple, and in a week I could make all my wants known and understand nearly everything that was said to me. Likewise, under Sola's tutelage I developed my telepathic powers so that I shortly could sense practically everything that went on around me. What surprised Sola most in me was that while I could catch telepathic messages easily from others, and often when they were not intended for me, no one could read a jot from my mind under any circumstances. At first this vexed me, but later I was very glad of it, as it gave me an undoubted advantage over the Martians. That's all we have time for tonight, listeners. This broadcast is a production of the Friedrich von Junz Library of Forgotten Worlds, with branches in Dusseldorf, Stregoikavar, and Corvallis. To learn more about our extratemporal institution of forgotten learning, please turn to our hub page at von-junst.org, v-o-n-j-u-n-z-t dot org, or if you prefer to visit in person, simply come to Dusseldorf on a clear moonless night, rent or purchase a small skiff, and silently paddle north on the Rhine until you see the great stone tower rising from its eastern banks. Thank you once again, listeners. Good night, and as always, I wish you intellectually gratifying